Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at First Baptist Church of Yazoo City. Of all the choices you have to make today, I am honored that you have chosen to worship with us in the comfort of your home. As you sit back, would you also participate in the service and allow the Lord to transform your life? For that's why we are here today. Thank you again for joining us. May God bless you today. There's indeed no other name that we come to glorify today. And there's no other name we're told under which by men are saved in the name of Jesus. And it's the name that Ella called upon and surrendered her life to. And because of that, today it's our honor, Ella, to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Jesus in baptism, and risen to walk in wholeness and fullness of life. don't know about you. I love it when we see children being baptized. Amen. These children have come through our VBS, our Sunday schools, our Awana program, and uh, it just, it means a lot as we're seeing children growing up in families who share Christ with them, and we encourage all of us. We want to continue to see that happen as we nurture them and they grow in the Lord. So it is, what a great way to start the service. We're going to sing today. What else can we say? But blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's stand as we sing.
so glad you could be here with us today. Uh, If you're a guest with us this morning, we'd ask that you would uh, take that flap out of your bulletin and fill that out and and place it in the offering plate, and that can be your offering to us this morning. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord, we come to you, and we just want to lift your name up, Lord, and we thank you for your son and what he's done for us. And uh, more than all today, God, I ask that as as we leave this place, uh, as as we've worshiped you, as you've been glorified, Lord, we pray that your spirit will have moved in us today. Lord, I pray that we would go out those doors and share your gospel with all that we find. Lord, and that our service this afternoon would not be about ourselves, God, but it would be about sharing your name with the lost. We pray this in your name. Amen. On this special day when us as a church going to leave this place and go out and serve in our community to show the love of Jesus Christ in many different ways. We're reminded once again that there's a world out there that does not know. And that world is right here in Yazoo City in Yazoo County. And uh, there's an old hymn. Sometimes we, we kind of toss some things aside and we miss a lot of really good theology and good messages. But there's an old hymn. I can remember my grandmother used to walk through the house singing. One of them was bringing in the sheaves. And I always thought she said, bringing in the sheets. And the other was rescue the perishing. And that's not a song we have sung a lot in church in the last few years, but we're going to sing that old hymn this morning. If you don't know it, it's easy tune. But I really want you to pay attention to the words because it really is all about what we are all about as a church today. So let's stand together as we sing. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin.
let us not forget ever the power of the name of Jesus. Amen. And one day, every knee will bow in heaven and earth, <laughs> under the earth, will bow at that name and proclaim, proclaim that he is Lord. Let us be among those who will do that willingly. This morning, if you would take your Bible, join us in Jonah chapter 4. Jonah's probably one of those pages in your book where, uh, your Bible, where the pages are stuck together. You know the first chapter probably, and that may be all that you know, but we, just to recap where we come as we come to Jonah chapter 4 is that the Lord calls Jonah to go to Nineveh, these horrible people, people that many believe had inflicted pain upon Jonah's family, and so therefore Jonah had no desire to go to these people. And so we know that he goes down, he buys a ticket to get on a boat and go to Tarshish to flee the opposite direction. While he's on the boat, the Lord brings about a great storm. If there's a series of events, Jonah tells the people, throw me overboard, I'm the reason for the storm. Jonah's thrown overboard. But think about it. He is so self-centered, and he's so miserable at that moment that he would rather lose his life than to stay on the boat and be obedient to the Lord. So they throw him over, and we know that a giant fish swallows Jonah up. And this would probably happen to any of us that were in the belly of a large fish and didn't die, that God kind of got Jonah's attention. And when the fish vomited Jonah out, it, Jonah said, all right, you know. And the Lord calls him a second time, which, by the way, the greatest miracle in Jonah is not that a great fish swallowed Jonah. The greatest miracle in Jonah is that a holy God would call a sinful person. That's the greatest miracle. And the second greatest miracle is that God would call a second time. Aren't you glad he's a God who calls us a second time and a third and a fourth and so forth? So the Lord calls Jonah, and Jonah goes to Nineveh. And he went with an eight-word message. Don't you wish you would hear one of those? Eight words that changed these people. Eight words as he told them in 40 days the Lord was going to come. He was going to destroy them if they didn't turn their hearts. And so the people turned from God. And in the last part of chapter 3, we see that that is what happens, that the people have turned to God, and God has relented from the destruction of that he had threatened, and so we come to chapter 4. But to this, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Verse 5, Jonah had gone out and sat down in a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in, its, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord had provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm was chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that it grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry that I wish I were dead. Verse 10, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who could not tell the right hand from the left, and also many animals? In this passage today, we see the miserableness of selfishness. Maybe you can relate to the story of a missionary couple who we're looking forward to a time of furlough. There had been a lot of mission activity on the field, a very stressful time for them. They were ready to get back to the States and, and to relax. And for the first time, they were going to be staying in a brand new studio apartment that had all sorts of new features. But the main thing the missionary wife was so happy about was that it had a patio. And she loved to decorate things, loved having plants and stuff. And she had in her mind what she was going to do to that patio. And that really became the centerpiece of her house. That's where she spent all of her time. Shortly after they moved in, another family moved in. And the, really the only way to describe this family would be to say that they were very coarse. As the kids were outside, there was always hollering and screaming and cussing back and forth. The young boys urinated in the front yard. 
They didn't bother to hide behind a tree like they were taught in the South. And so there in plain view of this lady, she had to see this every day. There were all these things that were happening. She was praying that God would move these people so that she could enjoy her time at home. One day, the tipping point happened when she came home. And she found orange paint from top to bottom in her patio. Everything that she had made, all of her plants were splattered with this orange paint. It was on the floor, it was on the walls, it was even on the ceiling fan that was outside. And that was it. In her anger, as God was convicting her of her need to love these people, she cried out and said, God, I cannot love them. I hate them. And then God struck her heart and she realized that indeed she needed to love these people and she made a list of things that she would do if she were to really love her exasperating neighbors and so she baked them cookies and she delivered them next door she offered to babysit for free she invited the mother over for coffee and the most beautiful thing happened she began to understand this family began to really see them she began to see they were living under extreme pressures she began to love her enemies she did good to them she lent without expecting anything in return and the day came that she had prayed for the day that they moved and on that day as she watched them pull out she wept for the unconventional unnatural unconditional love of God had captured her heart for those people you and I have those people in our lives people that we tell God God I cannot love them and maybe even those that we're bold enough to say God I hate them maybe it's someone who has wronged us maybe it's just someone who doesn't live like we live it may be someone that others would say that our feelings toward this person are excused they would be labeled as a bad person they are our Nineveh it could be a family member it could be your neighbor it could be a co-worker a classmate it may be a whole race of people or it could be where you live and I want us to consider the fact today that could possibly your Nineveh be where you live Yazoo County all you love may be the group of people that live around you. you may love your neighbors you may love those that you associate with but the fact that you realize that we as a church and you as an individual are called to reach the community in which we live your response back is God but I hate them they don't live right God they make horrible decisions. They're not like me. They've hurt me. And we throw out every excuse. But could it be today that you'd be willing to admit that I love Yazoo is just something that can roll off your tongue, but nothing that's in your heart? That you indeed live in the midst of your Nineveh. See, as we've talked about our priorities as a church beginning the first of the year, as we remember that we're here to make disciples. And that our priorities are to worship the Lord, to grow, and then that we are to serve others and we are to share of what we have. And so many, you're thinking, okay, I can handle the worship part because I can come and I love to sing and I know that God is God and He deserves our worship and our praise. And so I can come do the worship thing and I can even grow. I realize I have some areas of shortcoming in my life where I really need to be challenged and I need to grow. But when it comes to the serving and the sharing aspect, you are as miserable as Jonah for you have ran from going to your Nineveh. Whether it's an individual, whether it's a place, whether it's a group of people, whether it is that neighbor that you're like the missionary and you pray that they would move away. If you're honest, you are Jonah and that you are running away from God. You're running away from his specific call upon your life and you are living a selfish life. And chapter 4 shows us that this life is a life of misery. And we've talked a lot about joy lately. And Wednesday nights we've looked at Philippians, and many of our Sunday school classes have just finished today a study on the Philippians which talks about joy. 
And we talked about having joy in our worship. And it hit me this morning, is the reason that we lack joy is because we are living in disobedience and we are experiencing the miserableness of selfishness. Would you open up your life to at least consider that today? Because see, when that happens, we're so consumed with ourselves. We refuse to serve, we refuse to share, or when we do it, we excuse it by serving those who are already a part of us. This day was to be, is to be about serving our community. But we'll pat ourselves on the back and serve church members. We ought to be doing that all the time, friends. And so we come and we realize that we live in Nineveh. You live across the street from Ninevites, people that you don't like. You live in a county that may be full of them. You go to school with them, students. You work with them, adults. And we would assume just say, you know what? I'm not going. I will flee the other direction. And we live a life that we, if we will admit it, are spiritually miserable today. When that happens, when we're consumed with self, I want you to see what happens from Jonah's life. First of all, we're consumed with self. We become angry with who God is. See, the second part of verse 2 that Jonah lists are some of the best truths about God. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding to love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah is reminding us that God is unlike any other, that he is indeed gracious. That word may be translated in your Bible, merciful, that God does not give us what we deserve. He is gracious. He is compassion or compassionate. And in the Hebrew, that word refers to be soft like a womb. It gives us the picture of the soft compassion that a mother has for the child in her womb. Slow to anger means that God is patient. That he abounds in love is an intense word that is best understood as that God has unrelenting love for us. He relents from sending calamity is another form of compassion. This time speaking of the agonizing compassion that God has to face. Do I send calamity or not? And the decision that God struggles with. I want you to notice that Jonah has fleed because he knew this about God. I knew that you are. Notice that. Not I knew that you were a, but I knew, past tense, that you are present tense. See, God never changes. And I am thankful that I look at my life and how our God is a gracious God that give me what I deserve. That he is a compassionate God who deals with me like a mother deals with her child in the womb, softly. I'm gracious that he is patient with me. And oh, I stretch him. I promise you that. I'm gracious that he relents or has an unrelenting love that causes him to relent from sending again what I deserve in my life. And I believe all of us would testify that you're thankful for that. That it's not past tense, but that he still is that God. But when we are so consumed with self, we're grateful that God is that kind of God. But it, for us, as far as we're concerned, it stops with us. See, Jonah had experienced the grace of God in his life. He was called as a prophet. God had changed Jonah's life. But now he becomes angry with God. And that word angry in verse 1 really means he was inflamed. He was incensed. And that verse can be translated to Jonah. This was a disaster, a great disaster. He became inflamed. Oh, he was gr glad that God was gracious and compassionate and abounding in love to him. But he became incensed when God showed that to people that he did not think deserved it. So he's filled with this out-of-control anger because he did not believe that Nineveh deserved the chance to repent and then they did repent. He does not believe that their evil should be forgiven. He states that's why he didn't go in the first place, because he knew who God was and he didn't like it. He would rather die than see his enemies live. And the church response to this is, Clint, no, I, I would never, I would never feel that way. I may be selfish at times, but I, I would never act this way. What were you, let me ask you this. What would you do if someone assaulted one of your children or your grandchildren? I'm pretty sure that my response would not be pastoral. 
and yours neither. For we hear about those who do on, on the news that assault children, hurt children, and our, our thought to them, somebody we don't even know, is we say they ought to just rot in hell. There ought to be a special spot in hell for that person. But then we think that about a person that caused you to lose your job or that stole your promotion from you. We begin to think that about the person that ruined your marriage or that attempted to ruin your marriage. You think that about the person that cheated you out of some money. We begin to think that about the person that didn't treat our kids right at school. And we have to answer, can we serve those people? I'll answer, not if you're consumed with self. For if you're consumed with self, you, became, you become angry that God would forgive somebody that you believe does not deserve it. And so we pick up the paper twice a week, and we begin to read about the crimes on the front, and we open it up, and we see the report of who's been arrested and who's been to court. And if the next week we would have picked that up and it told us that every one of those people had been saved and be sitting in your Sunday school class next week, what would your response be? Would we be like Jonah? God, they don't deserve it. It's not real. And that's where Jonah was at. And when we are so consumed with self, friends, that's who we become. Running from God. And when God changes the lives of those that we believe he shouldn't, we become angry with him, but yet believe that we deserve that ourselves. So secondly, notice what happens when we're consumed with self. We go to great lengths to find comfort. See, Jonah hopes that God will destroy the city in spite of their repentance. And so in verse 5, we're told that he goes out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. So Jonah decides, I'm going to wait out the 40 days. He waits to see. He's holding out hope that the Ninevites either will return to their sin or that God will change his mind and rather than forgiving him or forgiving them, that God would bring destruction upon them. And Jonah's attitude is almost, God, I went to them because I had to. Similar to what we have when someone talks us into doing something that we really don't want to do and so we half-heartedly do it. That's the same attitude that I see with Jonah. God, I went over there halfway proclaiming your word. I just spoke eight words, 40, day, 40 more days, and then it will be overthrown. That's all I told them. I didn't want to go into great depths, and they have responded. And so Jonah goes to great lengths to find comfort that he goes out, and he makes himself a shelter. Now, when you think about it, he's already gone to great lengths to find comfort when he was running from God that he goes down and buys a ticket to go to Tarshish. Remind us again that sin always makes us pay. And then he tells the others on the boat, just throw me into the sea. At least there I will die and the storm will cease and we'll all be comfortable. And now Nineveh has repented, God has relented, and he erects a shelter. Now when you think about it, I don't imagine Jonah had those supplies with him in his backpack. He had to run down to Home Depot and buy them again, or go borrow some from somebody, or go collect them himself. You see him going to great lengths. And I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to be comfortable. And I'm going to watch and wait and see what happens. This shelter was reminiscent of the shelters that were built in the desert by the Hebrew people as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years prior to going into the promised land. Jonah's a prophet would have known about that. And as he sat under that shelter, it should have reminded him when his forefathers lived in something similar. And he should have been reminded about the grace of God upon their lives. But instead, he's pouting. So I get the picture of Jonah, just like happens in my house and many of your houses regular. You get on to somebody, and they've gone over in the corner. Their arms are crossed. That bottom lip is pooched out, or both lips are pooched out. They're mad. There's full-fledged pouting going on. They have thrown a royal fit. That's where Jonah's at. Just like a little child who did not get his way to the point that Jonah says, I would rather die than to live. God, I would rather die than to see you not destroy those people. See, there's discomfort when we live selfishly. When we are disobedient, there's discomfort in our life, and we go to great lengths to find comfort. 
And many times we refer to those who turn to substances, and many do that in hopes of finding comfort. But I have found that the majority of us try to find comfort by being busy. If we can have all kinds of activity, even spiritual activity, we can get our minds off of the disobedience that we live in. And that may be something you do when you've lost a loved one, that people tell you, just stay busy and kind of keep your mind off of it, find some things to do. But spiritually, that's horrible advice because it just covers up our disobedience. It leaves us empty. But often we go to great lengths when we know we are, we are disobedient to try to find that comfort, adding on everything in our life. And then we're physically wore out and we're miserable spiritually. And we're like Jonah, we're sitting in the corner pouting because God is having his way. Today, would we just give up those things and go to Nineveh? It's a whole lot easier. When we're consumed with self, thirdly, we live out of focus. So Jonah's sitting there under his shelter, and apparently it didn't provide enough shade for him. And so God provides a vine or a plant, as the NIV says. And notice that Jonah is happy for once. He was very happy about the plant, we're told in verse 6. He's sitting there thinking, well, look here, what's happened? Now I can be comfortable and watch it. And then the next day, God sent a worm or a grub that ate the plant. And now Jonah's back where he was the day before. He's angry that the worm had caused the vine to wither. And again, he pouts and reveals the pettiness of his heart when he tells God, I am angry enough to die. See, Jonah was more concerned about the withered vine than he was about the soul of lost men and the will of God. Jonah was living out of focus. He was more concerned about his comfort than he was the souls of men. And I'm afraid that that could be the condemnation of the church today, that we are more concerned about our comfort than we are that men and women living all around us, or dying daily and going to hell. You know, I wish most Mondays we sit around, and, and, and Mondays is kind of almost a recovery day because of Sundays. And we'll talk about things that we need to address, and most of the time it's some complaint that there was ran out of tissue in the bathroom, it was too hot or it was too cold, or there was some trash on the parking lot, or something that somebody came in and complained to one of us about. You know what I wish if somebody would call me Monday morning and go, Preacher, I'm heartbroken because nobody was saved in our service Sunday. But we're more worried about our comfort than we are the souls of men. We want everything to be in line. We're going to fuss about the minor stuff than we are about the fact that we are not seeing people's life be changed because we are not going and proclaiming the gospel to them. See, for far many believers and far too many churches today, the focus is on petty concerns rather than the priorities of God. These are things I read just this week from other churches. I wouldn't use ours. This week, the flower committee chairman has decided to quit because someone did not check with her before they put flowers on the altar last Sunday. The member of a committee is angry because a meeting was held when he was out of town. The Women's Kitchen Committee is up in arms because at the last youth group meeting, which had grown from 15 to 90 kids in six months, the kids took some sugar from the kitchen. The janitor is threatening to quit because the youth group played a game on the grass over the weekend, and now the lawn needs extra work. Preschool workers quit because the kids didn't behave properly. Nursery workers quit because when they started and agreed to, there wasn't but a couple kids in the nursery. Now there's a whole bunch of them, and we just can't handle it anymore. All those are examples of people who have lost their vision. They are people who have turned their eyes away from what matters, and they have focused instead on what does not matter. And the result is, is that we are mobile, immobilized by our obsession with things that are insignificant. It is time to rid our lives, and it's time to rid our church of pettiness. And if we're not careful, we'll become like Jonah, sidelining ourselves by being preoccupied 
with selfish and petty pursuits. Today, are you more concerned with your comfort than you are the souls of men? God, have mercy on us. When we live a life out of focus, brothers and sisters, remember, it's not about you. And remember, the church is the only organization in the world that exists for those who are not a part of it. And we need to get over the Jonas in our life and put our focus on the Lord. When we're consumed with self, though, we don't do those things, and so therefore we experience the discipline of God. See, the whole episode with the vine and the worm demonstrate the discipline of God. For as the vine grew and provided shade for Jonah, he once again had the opportunity to be reminded of the grace of God, that he had done nothing to deserve that vine growing, and that God had, had provided it so that he would have more shade. And Jonah had the moment, had the opportunity to go, you know what, I didn't ask for this. I've done nothing to deserve it. Just as the Ninevites did not ask God to be merciful toward them, and they don't deserve it. And there he could have got up and said, God, I am sorry. My focus was on myself. I'm going to proclaim to those people even further. But Jonah doesn't respond. And so not only does God send the worm to eat the vine, but then the conditions get worse. In verse 8, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. Why did God do that? He was grabbing at Jonah's heart. He was giving Jonah the opportunity to change his heart and his actions. But he was still so consumed with self that he would rather die. See, much of our misery with selfishness is a direct result of the discipline of God. So you may not be sitting out under a shelter that you made yourself or under a shade tree with a scorching wind and a blazing sun. But as a child of God, you know when God is disciplining you. Whether he's taking you to the woodshed and wore you out, or he's put you over in the corner, and you know that he's distant because you made that choice. When that fellowship is broken, you know when you're undergoing the discipline of God. But the sad thing is, we become so focused with self, we would assume just to stay there and be miserable. As a warning to remind you, if you live such a life and you don't experience the discipline of God, then you're not a child of God. For Hebrews 12 speaks to this, and it reminds us that the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. So could it be the reason why you're selfish and you refuse to love your Nineveh is because you have never experienced the grace of God yourself? For that's where we need to search our hearts today. Are we living under the discipline of God, or are we living as one who's not a child of God? And God will never discipline an illegitimate child. See, when we're consumed with self, as part of God's discipline, we're miserable. Two weeks ago, I believe I was the most miserable I had ever been in my life physically. Many of you know I had the flu that Saturday as I sat at the doctor's office. I might as well have been sitting on a stone. That chair was as hard as anything I'd ever been on. I couldn't get comfortable. I knew there were people in there that I couldn't even register who people were. I'd hear them call their name and go, I hope they don't think I'm rude today, but I don't, did not even recognize they were sitting over there. And I kept moving all around trying to get comfortable, and, and I could see some, some little gliders on the other side of the room that had cushions on them. And I started praying, Lord, if they don't hurry up and call those people back so I can get one of those chairs, just take my life. I was just like Jonah. And so finally they called them, and I got up and got in one of those chairs, and finally I got comfortable. And then finally they come out and call my name, and they take me back, and they had a matching set of those chairs and the other, that I've been sitting in earlier, and the other one was in the back. And I sat in it, and they did all that stuff, and they finally put me in a room, and I would sit in the chair and just lay my head on the exam table, trying to get comfortable, moving every other position that I could find. 
And many of you today are like that spiritually. You're miserable. You've gone to great lengths to find comfort. You've shifted positions. You've shifted churches. You've shifted careers. You've shifted spouses. You name it. You've changed it. You've tried to do it all to get comfortable. Bottom line is, your life is out of focus. And spiritually, you're experiencing the discipline of God. And so today, out of God's grace, you have an opportunity to do something that Jonah never did. The story kind of ends abruptly, and we have no record that Jonah ever repented. That he ever changed his heart. But today, you can. You can repent. And you can escape the misery that you're under. You can make your life not about yourself and take your focus and put it on the Lord and run the race He has for you. See, as a demonstration of who He is today, that He's gracious, He's compassionate, He's slow to anger, He's abounding in love, He's given you today this opportunity to move from being so selfish to being focused upon Him. Friends, we live maybe in your Nineveh. It's time for us to go there and proclaim to them the judgment that is coming. Let's pray. Holy God, we bow in your presence, thanking you for your word, for your spirit's work in our lives, and for the opportunity to change our lives as you have called us today. Lord, so often we get to this point in our service and we're just ready. We know it's getting close to time to go home. We're ready just to begin that process. Lord, let us approach this time different today. Lord, many you've taken to the woodshed. Your discipline is real. The miserableness is there. Let us come out of brokenness today and restore our fellowship with you. Lord, there are some here who've never experienced your grace. And today they need to understand that you are gracious and compassionate. You're patient and you're abounding in love. And they need to give their life to you. Lord, let us be obedient to how you have worked in our lives. We commit this time to you. Here we are, Lord. Use us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together? As we sing, if you have a public decision to make, if you need to come to this altar, it's open. Would you be obedient to God's call upon your life? Let us make this our prayer that God would take our life and consecrate our life to him. At this time, our service is a time for those in attendance to make public decisions as a response to hearing God's word and the Holy Spirit's leading in their life. Maybe the Lord has spoken to you today and there's a decision that you need to make or some questions that you need to answer or just some guidance that you need for some things you're facing in life. I'd like to invite you to call 888-JESUS-20 where you will be linked up with a counselor who can give you direction regarding the decisions that you need to make. You're also welcome to call us here at the church office on Monday morning, 746-2471. But I encourage you not to delay, not to wait until that time, but to right now take the time to make the decisions in your life for which God is leading you to make. Again, that number is 888-JESUS-20.
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Dear Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, we just pray as we go this afternoon, dear Lord, and we take the church outside of the building, dear Lord, that we just let others see Jesus in us, Heavenly Father. And we just pray that before our next I Love Yesu day come up, dear Lord, that you'll place on our heart a mission that we really need to undertake, dear Lord, and so that we can serve others, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, that are less fortunate than we are, Lord. You have blessed us so much in so many ways. And Father, we just thank you for this. And Lord, we just ask you to be with the D now weekend, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, we just pray for the youth. We pray for the leaders, dear Lord. We pray that one may come to know you as their personal Savior, dear Lord, that they'll have a personal relationship with you. And Lord, we just pray for the others that we just grow closer to you during the D9 weekend, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, we just ask your blessing upon this. And Lord, we just pray for more workers in the, the preschool, dear Lord, the kids department, dear Lord. We just pray for this, and we just pray that you send more children so we'll have to have more workers, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, we just ask you to continue to bless this church, and we thank you so much, dear Lord, for sending us Brother Clint to lead us and to guide us, dear Lord. Father, as we come to this part of the service, we just ask you to bless the gift and the gift for the fathers of your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. It is time as we have gathered now to worship for the church to leave the building. But we know before we do that, we have to feed you for the physical stamina that you need uh, because none of us have any excess that we can live off of. Um, and so as, uh, as we depart, if you will go to Fellowship Hall for those participating in, service, in, a, in a service project today, we have lunch for you. And uh, then after we eat, your class will, will uh, get together and begin to serve. And 
If maybe you're here and don't have a Sunday school class you're a part of and want to participate, let's see me, and uh, we'll get you plugged in somewhere, I promise you that. Uh, but let us be about serving this afternoon in ways in which we can demonstrate the love of Christ in practical ways. As Dallas prayed, and I appreciate him praying for Dean now this weekend, I want you to, uh, you're, you got a student that's not signed up, get them signed up. Uh, and have them here kick off Friday and we'll wrap up uh, with our service with our students next Sunday morning at this time also as part of that time uh, we will have a Gideon speaker at the end of our service for our annual uh, time where we get to collect the offering for them so if you'll just make that mental note and be aware of that and be prepared to give to that offering sacrificially and be aware of the other things that are in your bulletin uh, areas of service uh, deadlines that are coming up things you need to be involved in and I hope that you will take note of those and get plugged in as God gives you the chance to do so. Thanks for being here. I look forward to a great afternoon. Let's stand together as we sing and declare how great our God is and knowing that as we leave, through our actions, we declare that today. Oh.